got bubbles everywhere, and these bubbles are going to have to collapse and deleverage. We're in a bubble economy, especially since the mid 1990s, and bubbles have to burst. And they don't they don't correct. They don't go down slowly. They crash and burn. Silver investors could make a fortune. Billionaire Eric Sprott and other top gold analysts predict that silver will dramatically outperform the yellow metal. In order to maximize your exposure to silver, consider shares of Golden Arrow Resources trading on the TSX Venture under GRG and the US as GARWF, where insiders have accumulated 50% of the company and billion dollar giant Silver Standard Resources has taken an 8% stake in the company. This company has 250 million ounces of silver resources and is headed up by the one man who's responsible for the largest silver deposit discovery in history. Learn more at crushthestreet.com slash silver 100. Hello everyone and welcome into crushthestreet.com. I am Kenneth Amaduri and I'm joined today with a first time guest at Crush the Street. Uh, it's Harry Dent, author of the demographic cliff and editor of the free newsletter economy and markets and uh if if you'd like to visit his work and get a, a free copy of the demographic cliff uh visit harrydent.com you'll just have to pay the 495 for shipping and handling but i highly recommend that you go over to the website and get it and uh, I, I I don't need to do any more to that introduction. Harry Dent is the man. He's a thought leader, and he's he's quite the contrarian's contrarian. Uh, first of all, Harry, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, nice to be here, Ken. Harry, there's a huge debate out there regarding inflation, deflation, and I know you've made this case uh, that when there's a massive amount of deleveraging, deflation will certainly take place. And we know that central banks are attacking the contraction of the economy, the global economies, with money printing and asset purchasing. You know, it, you know, with this in mind, please help us make some sense of this economic dynamic. Well, you know, it is simple. We see about once in a human lifetime, every 60 to 80 years, and now it's more like 80 years since the last roaring 20s bubble and the last Great Depression of deleveraging, we see debt bubbles that, you know, debt grows way faster in the economy and everybody thinks it's okay at first and interest rates are falling. And, but that creates financial asset bubbles and stocks and real estate and commodities or whatever, you know, especially whatever is key at the time. And then that debt bubble has to deleverage at some point and those financial asset bubbles burst. But what the gold bugs don't get, I, I agree with the gold bugs who are contrarians who say, Hey, all this central bank, something for nothing, print money, cover over a debt, a debt crisis is not going to work. We're only going to get a worse price. I agree 120% with them on that. But what they don't do is go back in history and see what happens when debt bubbles and financial asset bubbles actually burst and deleverage. They're looking back at the 1970s, the last financial crisis we had longer term which was not as much debt driven. It was inflation driven because the baby boomers were entering the workforce at the highest rates in history and young people cost a lot of money to raise and incorporate in the workforce. And that's what causes inflation. Mm. Not typically money printing as they think because they weren't doing QE in the 1970s. We were running deficits, but we've run way bigger deficits in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s and had falling inflation. So the gold bugs don't really understand inflation. They, don't, they, they understand that, that borrowing money at two and a half times the growth of GDP for 26 years can't end well. Kudos for that. They're realists. But they do not understand deleveraging. Every time in history we've seen a debt bubble, you see financial asset bubbles. Sometimes it's more in real estate, sometimes more in stocks. This time it's everything. Mm. We had commodities bubble, gold bubble, stocks bubble, real estate around the world bubble. And all these bo and bonds are bubbling now. Bonds are yielding negative in more and more places and near zero. It's certainly zero adjusted for inflation longer term. We've got bubbles everywhere, and these bubbles are going to have to collapse and deleverage. And it means for investors, just once in a lifetime, you can't listen to your damn stockbroker. I'm just sorry. I've worked with stockbrokers for decades. I used to be the most popular speaker in that industry in the 90s when I was so bullish based on the demographic spending trends of baby boomers that I alone saw, and I alone saw 
the fall of Japan in the 90s because of the same baby boom there, peaking a decade and a half ahead of us in the United States and two decades ahead of Europe. So yeah. we look at what really matters. When do people spend money? We look at cycles in geopolitical politics, which we're in a negative cycle since 9-11. It continues for the next four years. So all this stuff you hear about terrorism and, and failed wars and civil wars and police brutality and all this sort of that. You're going to see more of that in the next four years, and then things are going to start to get better because everything in life goes into cycles. Yeah. What I had to stumble on in the late, uh, mid to late 80s was how important demographics were in modern times because we never had middle-class societies before World War II. And ever since, it's been the average person spending in mass generational waves that has driven the ups and downs in our economy. And the reason we've had endless quantitative easing, endless zero interest rates and stimulus is governments are trying to counter the decline, the natural decline in baby boom spending that already hit Japan in the 1990s hard. And they're trying to keep the greatest debt bubble and financial asset bubble in history, which they helped stoke tremendously. They're trying to keep it from bursting because at least Ben Bernanke studied the Great Depression and realized when these debt, debt bubbles deleverage and you get deflation instead of inflation, again, what the gold bugs don't get, it is the worst for the economy, the highest unemployment, the greatest business failures, and, and the greatest bank failures. And, and all we've done since 2008 is stop the next Great Depression from happening with endless money printing, and it looks like it's getting ready to unravel again to me because you can only do you know keep a, an economy going artificially with free money for so long because free money causes its own excesses and greater bubbles and misinvestment. The whole fracking industry was a trillion dollar waste of money because fracking would have never been viable without quantitative easing and goosing up oil prices temporarily. And of course, they've been falling. I've been saying oil prices would go back to 10 to 20 bucks. We've already seen 26 and it's not even over yet. So so the frackers are dead. Mm. They can only make it at 70, 80 bucks. Yeah. And, and and, and cheap junk bonds allowed them to even get in the game in the first place. And those are not no longer cheap now that they're defaulting. So all of this is clear. People just don't want to look at reality. And people, what I, I say to people, Kenneth, the most, that my big advantage, demographics, I've become the leading expert in the world because I, I found out how important it was and dug into it. But my advantage is I'm just simply a realist to realize every cycle goes up and goes down. I'm not a Republican or Democrat. I'm not a bull or a bear. I've been the most bullish economist in history, and now I'm one of the most bearish because we're in a bubble economy, especially since the mid-1990s, and bubbles have to burst, and they don't, they don't correct, they don't go down slowly, they crash and burn, and typical bubbles, commodities, and stocks are 80%, give or take, before they bottom, and in real estate, 50 to 60%. So and when, when, you know, there's some people saying, oh, we need a 20% correction, you're not going to get a 20% correction when this stock bubble burst, this next one's going to be worse than 2008 and 9. It's going to be a 70% correction. And, and it'll take many years before all these negative trends, geopolitics and demographics bottom out. And by then, I think the stock market can be down 80%. So when your stock broker says, oh, just hang in, stocks already come back. Well, try doing that from 1929 to 41 when they went down 80% and didn't come back until 1953. People yeah. would have their stock stockbroker back then if the stockbroker didn't already jump off a building. Yeah. <laughs> well, well said, sir. Um, I got to ask you then more about like maybe the mechanics. Maybe this is more of a mechanical question of the economy, and that's the velocity of money. And we know that it's at very, very low levels, the velocity of money, but there's a lot of cash out there on banks' balance sheets. And, yeah. you know, I, I want to ask you, you know, what happens in this scenario that you're describing with the money that's sitting on banks balance sheets? Will it circulate? And could that be the cause of the inflation? Well, no, I mean, that's the cause of, of the low inflation. No matter how much money the central banks put in the economy, that money is, is just a tiny trickle compared to the total money supply. It's only if banks are lending it, it up to 10, 10 times um, the deposits they pledge at 10%, does money supply expand rapidly? So there is a cycle, and we have a great graph on this from, from Lacey Hunt, my, one of my favorite real economists, because I'm not a real economist. You know, I was a business, <laughs> became an economist by taking a different view, but he shows that in, in, in the best booms, money velocity will grow 
um, and it'll go up because banks are lending and, and companies and, and investors, I mean, households are investing in productive capacity. Companies are building plants that create jobs and productivity and profits and people are buying houses that reduce their cost of living, all this good stuff. But there's a point in the stage where the money velocity starts to slow and that shows, oh, now we're switching in. Things have gotten so good, people just want to retire at age 50 and flip stocks out of their home or flip homes out of their home. And then now, and, and, and hedge funds are leveraging up. Everybody's speculating the economy's been so good. Well, this is, does not create future jobs and capacity and prosperity. So that shows you're getting in a bubble phase. And that, that money velocity actually peaked in 1998 and has been falling like a rock ever since, despite the greatest money printing and debt bubble in history, because it's all been going into speculation, stock buybacks, all this sort of thing. Well, there comes a point in that cycle where you get below the average rate of money velocity. We're already well into that, which shows you're actually into a deleveraging pattern. And again, we're in a pattern just like 1930 to 31 right now. The difference is all this quantitative easing is just keep keeping to put enough money into the banking system, even though it's not getting lent and it's just sitting on the bank balances, to keep the banks from going under, which then triggers the deleveraging. The bank failures... And in business failures, triggers the deleveraging. They're keeping enough liquidity in the system to keep it from going down. And that's why, no matter how much it doesn't benefit the average person and how slow the economy grows despite massive stimulus, central banks have no option but to keep doing this because the moment they stop, it's all over and the whole thing will melt down and you will have a great depression. Because they've only created more debt in the world. 50. Mm-hmm. Seven trillion extra debt since the last financial crisis, and most of it in emerging countries that are the least credit worthy. Uh, Harry, uh, I guess then you know what a lot of gold bugs would say, and even what I would say is the the loss of faith in the currency could cause inflation, and you know we're seeing the the. Well, wait, wait. Currency. Who's got the worst currency? Japan's been printing the most money. Oh yeah. There's- well, that's what I was going to ask you. You know, and what are your thoughts on that? You know, is it a, is it a matter of, you know, the U.S. being the best in the worst scenario, and so therefore it will sustain this global, you know, economic crisis as people go into the U.S. dollars, and that's the the support that it will receive over time. Go ahead and just kind of, yeah. you know, give yeah. a, give us your thoughts on that. Again, with, with, I agree with gold bugs and so many things, and, and half of my presentation is identical to theirs when I give one. But they have two uh, illusions or delusions. One is that gold is, is still possible to be the backer of the money supply. They still think gold's money. All the gold in the world would fit in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. There's no way the modern information-based healthcare, technology, financial service, service economy today could, could be backed by a tiny amount of gold produced in crazy third world countries that you don't know what the hell is going to happen next. And gold goes up and down like a yo-yo. It's been, how can that be the basis for money? Mm. Um, so, and and, and, and they, they, they just don't get that that when you go this far and lever up the kind of this much, you have to deleverage and prices have to come down and gold, like everything else, comes down. They don't get that despite... I mean, gold did go up at first in late 2008, the last part of the gold bubble. And gold is a bubble like everything else. It went up eight times in 10 years. That's a bubble, damn it, Uh, much more than stocks were. Um, It went up at first thinking the the logical thing that gold bugs think and most people think, if governments are printing massive amounts of money, it's going to create inflation. No, it doesn't if the banks don't lend it and expand that money because that the money base is a tiny part of the total money supply. People don't get that. So they don't get that this deleveraging has to create a contraction in the money supply. And that means the price of everything from real estate to stocks to health care to college educations to consumer goods to commodities and even gold goes down. Gold follows inflation. Crystal clear throughout history, back hundreds of years, adjusted for inflation, gold returns nothing. And, it, and unlike real estate, which also returns nothing adjusted for inflation long term, you can't rent it out or make income off of it. Mm-hmm. So gold is actually the worst investment. It's a great commodity. It's great for jewelry. It used to be a good, highly concentrated commodity to back a commodity-based 
smaller global economy. It simply can't do that and never will. We are never, ever, ever, unless maybe just temporarily going back to a gold standard. And the final delusion is currencies are not like stocks and bonds that have some intent, have some tangible value based on what they earn or produce or, or, or even commodities. Currencies trade relative to each other. And as, as you said, entering this question, the U.S. dollar has gone up since January 2008 when this crisis happened. It's up about 40 percent from there uh, versus other currencies simply because it's the best house in a bad neighborhood. We tapered quantitative easing sooner. Japan has triple our quantitative easing and has been for many years. Europe is, you know, keeps pulling out the bazooka and Draghi. Our demographics are not great, but they're way better than Europe, and Europe's is way better than Japan. So the weakest countries and the countries with the worst trade balances and the highest debt and the greatest money ground, their currency is going to be weaker. But currencies don't go to zero unless you just become a totally bankrupt Zimbabwe type of nation. And there's only a handful of examples over time. You see that in South America, Africa. Germany is the famous example. They lost World War I, were totally bankrupt, and then the Allies came and put reparations on top of that. You, you, in other words, you're going to make a bankrupt country pay giant reparations for the war, so Germany just printed money like crazy. That is not what's happening today. Mm. Governments are printing money just to keep the damn bad banks from falling down and the whole economy and bubble collapsing. That's all they're doing. And they have no other choice, and, and, and it's a pathetic um, um, a stupid thing to do, but that's what they're doing. And and if they didn't ha had not done it, we would have already seen a depression on our hands. And when this thing flames out, which it's, we're seeing more and more signs, like China's stock market collapsing 50% in a few months, that's the sign of a bubble starting to burst there. Well, if their stock bubble keeps bursting, when their real estate bubble bursts in China, there is no bubble in the world to compare to China. The amount they invest in real estate, the amount of money they save, the government building stuff for nothing. I mean, how, they, they're the only major country to have a real estate bubble with 27% condos vacant. You think any place in the United States that they had 27% empty condos at home could be going up in price? So, so. No, no, that's 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 a good point. <laughs> Uh, Harry, you know, you, you brought up gold and you brought up that it doesn't pay an, an interest rate. Uh, and I want to get your thoughts on, you know, what we've seen here with gold here in 2016. You know, it's breaking through 52 week highs. You know, it, it appears that the bottom is in if you were to look at technical levels and different things like that. However, uh, you know, one of the things that you did bring up is that it doesn't pay an interest rate. But we are in a, an economy, a global economy where there's you know, $12 trillion of negative interest debt. And I would say that people would rather own gold than something that is going to, uh, you know, lose principle over time. And I'm sure, you know, you're going to say that gold will lose its principle yeah. over time if you well, bought and, it and, and so, it goes down. Well, but, but yeah, go ahead and go ahead and explain yourself on that. Only in the last year has gold gone up. But the, we predicted this. We predicted especially when gold broke out of a channel from 1525 to 1800, we said, once gold breaks 1525, it's going to collapse. And it did right down to 1180. And then over months, it kept sliding to 1050. And when it got down there, we said, Hey, that we're due for a bear market rally. Nothing goes straight down except for oil. Most things go, they have a first crash, then they have a bear market rally. Then they have a second crash and a bear market rally. And then a third crash where they bought them. We're simply seeing that second crash. We were predicting the goal would bounce back to around 1400. It got to 1373. And frankly, I think we've already seen it. And the reason I think we've already seen that bear market rally is, is the futures traders in gold. There's the smart money, the real hedgers, and they call them commercials, who are totally bearish right now and short. And the large hedge funds and traders are all totally bullish at record levels. That says gold is going down, not up, because the smart money's always right. Mm. So I think gold's got another major leg down. It's going to hit 700 bucks in the next year or two, and, it, and it's probably going to go back to where the bubble started around four to five hundred bucks back in 2005 or so. So I think this is just a bear market rally, and we just told people after telling them gold was going to rally. It's time to get out again. So don't. Yeah, it's up, but 
it's up only it's on up you know a couple hundred points from being down you know from 1800 to 1050 so down 950 and then it bounces 250 300 points that's a bear market rally and, and and the sentiment is saying this is a bear market rally and so are the charts we should see at least another major wave down before gold has a chance of bottoming this was just the middle way not the last way yeah well, Harry, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, like I said when we first started this interview, you're a contrarian contrarian, and uh, I, I really do appreciate your insight. It's uh, all amazing stuff. And, you know, we're all trying to, you know, make sense of this, this global economy and this global uh, meltdown that we're seeing. And I, I really do appreciate your insight. So if you have any closing words of advice and uh, if you want to just share a little more information on what you, your services and your books and what you have to offer, please do so. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, again, I just advise that we are, I mean, bubbles are bubbles. Nobody sees bubbles for a simple reason. We're getting something for nothing when a bubble's happening. You're sitting in your house and it's going up 10, 15% a year when it normally goes up with inflation 3% a year. You're getting something for nothing. Stocks, when they start going up 20% a year rather than the average 7%, you know, adjusted for inflation, you're getting something for nothing. People love that. It's a high. It's great. Nobody wants it to end. So everybody turns a blind eye. Bubbles are totally obvious. I got a new book coming out in the next month called The Sale of a Lifetime. And it's it's talks about demographics and cycles, as we always do, but the whole focus is what are bubbles, how do they build, what do they look like, and the whole theme is if it looks like a bubble, quacks like a bubble, it's a bubble, damn it. And mm. everybody I debate on financial channels and CNBC and Fox Business, everybody can say, oh, it's not a bubble because of this. I don't care what causes a bubble. Zillions of things can cause bubbles. Strikes, OPEC cartels bad weather, disasters, over debt, over, uh, you know, limited supply, um, baby boomers buying everything in huge ways. All these things pop up. The point is nothing can grow exponential against the fundamental trend until the bubbles wear themselves out just because even the rich or nobody can afford it anymore or everybody's piled in the market. So you have to recognize bubbles. And, and they're clear when you look at them. You sit back and look at the charts, you measure certain things as we spell out in the book. It's clear if something's a bubble or not. As I said earlier, everything, most real estate, major real estate markets, coastal real estate markets are in bubbles, including in emerging markets. All stock markets almost are in bubbles. And commodities were the first bubble to burst. And when they started bursting, we said oil's not going to go down to 100 or 90. It's going to go down to 10 to 20 bucks. And everybody said, that's impossible, Harry, with all this global stuff and all this production. And I said, no, when bubbles burst, they tend to go down 80% or back to where they started. And, and this is what happens. So, so it, commodities, iron ore is down 80% from its top, for crying out loud, and coal uh, and oil and all these things. So bubbles are predictable. The problem is people just don't see them. They don't want to see them, so they don't see them. So I'm like that. That's why I'm the contrarian's country. And I'm not trying to be. I'm looking at reality, and everybody is in la-la land hoping that this thing, that quantitative easing works, hoping these bubbles don't burst, and thinking, oh, they're not really that bubbly anyway. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've studied history. There are no bubbles, especially China. I can't even compare China or this global bubble to any bubble in history. It is so extended. It is so pervasive and so global. Um, anybody with a right mind would be getting very cautious and saying the trick to a bubble is to cash out while it's still up there and avoid the crash. And the crash, most of the crash will happen in two to three years in most things. You just have to get out of the way for a short period of time. And you got to be uh, like Baron Rothschild, who, when asked about the secret of his wealth in the 1800s, said, I always got out of markets a little early. That was his simplest answer. You've got to get out ahead because when bubbles burst, and again, quick example, China, 50% in a couple of months, the tech bubble, the first two and a half months, down 40%, they burst very rapidly. Oil's first crash was down 80% in four and a half months. So you're better to get out now and not hold out for the last five or 10%. I think now or in the next six months, these bubbles, the final bubbles and bonds and stocks are going to burst, and we're going to see several years of the worst downturn since 1929 to 32. And if you don't see it coming, you're going to be shocked and you're going to feel like an idiot. So 
That's all we do. We got a newsletter that's free. We've got paid newsletters, but the, the free newsletter daily. You can also get a harrydent.com just to get to know us better. We've got the, the, the paperback uh, revised version of the great uh, of the demographic cliff that you can get for free with four ninety five shipping. And in the next month, our company's going to start promoting our new book. It just went to press and it'll be out in about three weeks. Uh, it's called The Sale of a Lifetime. Well, there you have it, everyone. Harry Dent. Harry Dent, thanks for coming on the show with me today. Sure, Kenneth. Enjoyed it. Stocks. This time, it's everything. Mm. We had commodities bubble, gold bubble, Stocks bubble, real estate around the world bubble, and all these bo- and bonds are bubbling now. Bonds are yielding negative in more and more places, and near zero. It's certainly zero adjusted for inflation longer term. We've got bubbles everywhere, and these bubbles are going to have to collapse and deleverage. And it means for investors, just once in a lifetime, you can't listen to your damn stockbroker. I'm just sorry. I've worked with stockbrokers for decades. I used to be the most popular speaker in that industry in the 90s when I was so bullish based on the demographic spending trends of baby boomers that I alone saw and I alone saw the fall of Japan in the 90s because of the same baby boom there peaking a decade and a half ahead of us in the United States and two decades ahead of Europe. So we look at what really matters. When do people spend money? We look at cycles and geopolitics, which we're in a negative cycle since 9-11. It continues for the next four years. So all this stuff you hear about terrorism. And- that central banks are attacking the contraction of the economy, the global economies, with money printing and asset purchasing. You know, it, you know, with this in mind, please help us make some sense of this economic dynamic. Well, you know, it is simple. We see about once in a human lifetime, every 60 to 80 years, and now it's more like 80 years since the last roaring 20s bubble in the last Great Depression of deleveraging, we see debt bubbles that, you know, debt grows way faster in the economy. And everybody thinks it's okay at first and interest rates are falling. And but that creates financial asset bubbles and stocks and real estate and commodities or whatever, you know, especially whatever is key at the time. And then that debt bubble has to deleverage at some point and those financial asset bubbles burst. But what the gold bugs don't get, I, I agree with the gold bugs who are contrarians who say, hey, all this central bank, something for nothing, print money, cover over a debt, a debt crisis is not going to work. We're only going to get a worse price. I agree 120 percent with them on that. But what they don't do is go back in history and see what happens when debt bubbles and financial asset bubbles actually burst and deleverage. They're looking back at the 1970s, the last financial crisis we had longer term, which was not as much debt driven. It was inflation driven because the baby boomers were entering the workforce at the highest rates in history. And young people cost a lot of money to raise and incorporate in the workforce. And that's what causes inflation, Mm. not typically money printing, as they think, because they weren't doing QE in the 1970s. We were running deficits, but we've run way bigger deficits in the 80s, 90s and 2000s. It had falling inflation. So the gold bugs don't really understand inflation. They don't. They, they understand that, that borrowing money at two and a half times the growth of GDP for 26 years can't end well. Kudos for that. They're realists. But they do not understand deleveraging. Every time in history we've seen a debt bubble, you see financial asset bubbles. Sometimes it's more in real estate, sometimes more. Street.com. I am Kenneth Amaduri, and I'm joined today with a first-time guest at Crush the Street. Uh, it's Harry Dent, author of The Demographic Cliff and editor of the free newsletter, Economy and Markets. And uh, if, if you'd like to visit his work and get a, a free copy of The Demographic Cliff, uh, visit harrydent.com. You'll just have to pay the four ninety five for shipping and handling, but I highly recommend that you go over to the website and get it. And uh, I, I I don't need to do any more to that introduction. Harry Dent is the man. He's a thought leader, and he's he's quite the contrarian's contrarian. Uh, first of all, Harry, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, nice to be here, Ken. 
Harry, there's a huge debate out there regarding inflation, deflation, and I know you've made this case uh, that when there's a massive amount of deleveraging, deflation will certainly take place. And we know bubbles everywhere and these bubbles are going to have to collapse and deleverage we're in a bubble economy especially since the mid 1990s and bubbles have to burst and they don't they don't correct they don't go down slowly they crash and burn silver investors could make a fortune billionaire eric sprott and other top gold analysts predict that silver will dramatically outperform the yellow metal in order to maximize your exposure to silver consider shares of golden arrow resources trading on the tsx venture under grg and the us as garwf where insiders have accumulated 50 percent of the company and billion dollar giant silver standard resources has taken an eight percent stake in the company this company has 250 million ounces of silver resources and is headed up by the one man who's responsible for the largest silver deposit discovery in history. Learn more at crushthestreet.com slash silver 100. Hello everyone and welcome into Crush the Street.